Today I'll be presenting our experience in performing vitrectomy in patients with multifocal intraocular lenses who suffer from vision degrading myodysopsia. Financial disclosures are listed here. There are no relevant conflicts of interest. Posterior vitreous detachment is the most common cause of vitreous floaters due to the dense matrix of collagen fibrils in the posterior vitreous cortex, as well as folding of the posterior vitreous cortex after it separates away from the retina. This is the mechanism in older individuals. The mean age in our experience has been 61 years. However, younger individuals also suffer from vitreous floaters, and in that case, the etiology is myopic vitreopathy, as demonstrated in the middle panel below. Aggregates of collagen in the vitreous body interfere with the transmission of photons to the retina, resulting in shadows that patients see as floaters, and sometimes they are very bothersome. However, many doctors consider vitreous floaters just a nuisance and not a disease, and I've often wondered why that is. I believe it's because of the absence of objective clinical indices of vitreous structure and visual function that would enable the definition of vitreous floaters as a disease. And this absence has hampered acceptance of floaters as clinically significant. We employ the term vision degrading myodysopsia to define uh, clinically significant cases, but based upon objective quantitative measures of vitreous structure employing quantitative ultrasonography and measures of contrast sensitivity function because visual acuity is not revealing in these cases. This graph compares contrast sensitivity function on the x-axis with vitreous echo density on the y-axis. The Weber index on the x-axis reflects contrast sensitivity function, and the higher the number, the worse the contrast sensitivity function. What you can see is that with increasing density of the vitreous, there is increasing degradation of contrast sensitivity function. And we have found these two measures to be very useful in evaluating patients and determining whether the case is mild, moderate, or severe, and offering therapy to the appropriate cases. Limited vitrectomy is our go-to procedure, and this graph demonstrates the effects of limited vitrectomy on contrast sensitivity function. On the left-hand side of the graph, you can see a comparison to 70 age-matched controls with 139 individuals who complained of bothersome floaters. Contrast sensitivity function was reduced on average by 92% in these individuals. Within one week of limited vitrectomy, each case normalized and remained normal for months and years thereafter. We know that multifocal intraocular lens degrade contrast sensitivity function. So the question arises, would vitrectomy improve contrast sensitivity function in eyes with multifocal intraocular lenses? And this study was designed to answer that question. There were 180 subjects in this study group. 55 had multifocal intraocular lenses, 60 had monofocal IOLs, and 65 were phakic. Quantitative ultrasonography and measurements of contrast sensitivity function were performed in each case. 94 of these individuals chose observation, while 86 chose to undergo limited vitrectomy. Interestingly, vitreous echodensity was 67.5% greater in the group that chose vitrectomy as compared to those who chose observation. Similarly, contrast sensitivity function was 31% worse in the group that chose vitrectomy as compared to the observation group. Within the observation group, vitreous echodensity was the same in all lens cohorts. Yet, 
contrast sensitivity function was 20% worse in the group with multifocal IOLs as compared to the group with monofocal IOLs and 49% worse as compared to phacic eyes. Within the group who chose limited vitrectomy, preoperative vitreous equidensity was the same in all lens cohorts. Yet preoperative contrast sensitivity function was 25% worse in the multifocal group as compared to the group that had monofocal intraocular lenses. Limited vitrectomy has been established in various studies as a safe and effective way to cure vision degrading myodysopsia. But what do we know about its effects in eyes with multifocal IOLs? Well, postoperatively, vitreous echodensity improved in this study by 71% in the phacic eyes, 76% in the eyes with monofocal intraocular lenses, and 86% in the eyes with multifocal intraocular lenses. This graph demonstrates contrast sensitivity function before and after limited vitrectomy. The black bars represent preoperative levels of contrast sensitivity function, and the gray bars demonstrate postoperative levels. As you can see, Multifocal IOL eyes had a 37% improvement in contrast sensitivity function postoperatively. In monofocal IOL eyes, there was a 48% improvement, while phacic eyes experienced a 41% improvement in contrast sensitivity function postoperatively. And these were all statistically significant results, but also clinically significant because the patients were very happy with their vision following limited vitrectomy. So in conclusion, patients with vision degrading myodysopsia who elected vitrectomy had greater vitreous echodensity and worse contrast sensitivity function than controls preoperatively. Multifocal IOLs had even worse contrast sensitivity function than monofocal IOL and phacic guys, likely due to the additive effects of the multifocal IOL and opacification of the vitreous body. Limited vitrectomy reduced echodensity and improved contrast sensitivity function in all eyes. Thus, Patients with multifocal intraocular lenses and vision degrading myodysopsia merit consideration of, limit, of limited vitrectomy as a reasonable, effective, and safe therapeutic option. Thank you very much for your attention.